already been fulfilled. Uh, everyone wants to study the ones that are yet to come, and, and that's interesting, and, and, and we do a lot of speculation of how it's going to be fulfilled. I mean, when you talk about the mark of the beast, you know, what is it going to be, how is it going to be done, who is the Antichrist, everybody wants to get into all those things, and in speculation because it's future. But God has already proven himself by fulfilling pro prophecies that were made long ago, and they're amazing because we can see the fulfillment of it. But anyhow, in the process of doing all that, we uh, got into the area of, we started realizing that there's a tale of two cities that run through the Bible. And so uh, we covered a couple prophecies along the way, but, but what we've been looking at is how the Bible starts out where Babylon becomes the center of where man is, even right after the flood. Even, even the Garden of Eden was over in that area. And then after the flood, man settled there. And then ultimately you see that that becomes the seat of Satan in the world. And, and what we've done, we've gone from Genesis to 2 Samuel and, and saw that God has now established Jerusalem as the place, it's called His house. Uh, and, and there's going to be a temple there that's called His house, but that's the place that God has chosen in the earth to manifest His presence. And ultimately, His presence will be uh, on the earth, in Jerusalem, on the throne of David. And, and I put up these Bible verses because it's going to take us right through the Bible. Because, you know, that we've already gone Genesis to 2 Samuel, and, and you, we've already talked about the relation of 2 King, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, as it matches 1 and 2 Chronicles. But anyhow, if we just take it to Samuel, the, 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 in, in the early, you know, the Bible, the Old Testament, we usually break it down into uh, a threefold division. There's the historical books, the poetical books, and the prophetical books. Uh, and the historical books, that Genesis to 2 Samuel, out of the poetical books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, you know, because that's all under David and Solomon, uh, and it's a time in which Jerusalem uh, took precedence over in the earth. Um, so those, those, those books all relate to this time period. Where we're going to go today is we're going to realize that after Jerusalem becomes the main place, all of a sudden it's going to go from Jerusalem back to Babylon. And uh, historically, what's going to happen in Kings and in Chronicles is going to be a record of how Jerusalem is finally given over to the king of Babylon, and, and, over th and Babylon's going to rule over Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and in the time of like Solomon's life, Ecclesiastes is, is like Solomon looking at things not from a biblical point of view. I'm not exactly sure where to put the Song of Solomon in that there's both uh, loss and recovery in that. In, that, in those poetical books. But certainly at that time, God is, during the time that they're falling to Babylon, God's going to raise up Isaiah and all the prophets from Isaiah to Zephaniah talk about this time where Babylon, Jerusalem, is going to be given over to Babylon. But then after they, that happens, the Old Testament doesn't end that way, Babylon gives back over to Jerusalem. As Babylon will, be, will not become a, a major player in, at the end of the Old Testament, Jerusalem comes back as there's going to be a, a restoration of Israel back to the land, and those are in the historical books of Ezra, Ezra to Esther, and the prophetical books of Haggai through Mag Malachi, and that ends the Old Testament. But if you think about the New Testament, the New Testament, you're going to go from Jerusalem back to Babylon again. John the Baptist is showing up, just like the prophets showed up, and is calling the nation of Israel to repentance and warning about wrath to come. And from Matthew to Revelation 6, it, it, Jerusalem is going to fall again to Babylon. It, that's, that's what's going to happen. And, and, but it doesn't end that way. From chapter 17 to 22 in the book of Revelation, Babylon is then taken over again by Jerusalem once and for all, and God has his purpose and place in the earth. So your whole Bible, uh, like we said, it's a tale of two cities. And uh, so now you've got, it took us a long time to get this far. Hopefully these are just one, two, three, four, five maybe studies. Uh, but I, I want you to be familiar with the Bible and, uh, and realize how these places are important to God. So take your Bible and, and let me do this first to kind of remind you something. Get Genesis chapter 28 and, second, and 1 Chronicles tw uh, 22. Actually, we just read them in, the, in that order. I, I didn't put up the Bible map. I could have done that. 
But Genesis chapter 28. Now this is where Jacob, when he was leaving the land that God promised to Abraham, and then God gives him a vision and, and a promise about his return someday, and, the, and how he's going to be an heir of the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, it says in verse 16 of Genesis 28, uh, he had this vision of a ladder extending into heaven, angels, uh, um, was it ascending and descending on the ladder? Verse 16 says, And Jacob awoke out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, uh, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose early from, from the morning and took him a stone and, and, uh, that he had for, for pillows and, and set it for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, uh, but the name of that place was called Luz uh, at the first. And then he makes a vow, and, and he'll fulfill that vow later in Genesis. We've already looked at all that. But I want you to know, the place that he calls the house of God there, he call, the, it, it, the name of that place is called Bethel by him. Uh, um, the house of God, right. I want to make sure of that before I said it. Uh, so, but interesting, because I thought about this. Bethel, and then he calls it the house of God. Now come over to First Chronicles, First uh, Chronicles 22, and actually there's two verses we'll look at here. It says in verse one, and and remember this is where God had just spared Jerusalem from a judgment. And, uh, and a destruction. And it, and it says in, in chapter 22, uh, 1 Chronicles, verse 1, Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. So the place that we saw, Ornan the, the Jebusite, that David took and built an altar unto the Lord, that that place where he built that altar, he says it's called, he calls it the house of the Lord God. And then remember, if you just flip over to 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David, his father, in the place, of, uh, in the place that David had prepared for, in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And he began to build in the second day, in the second month, in the fourth for, for, uh, for fourth year of his reign. Now these are the things wherein Solomon was instructed for the building of the house of God. And then it goes into all the information. But see, the point is he's calling it the house of God. I thought to myself, I don't, I don't have the map here. There is really only 10 miles between Bethel and Jerusalem. Jerusalem just south of, of, of Bethel by 10 miles. So we're talking about the same area. But it is interesting that at the first place it's called the house of God, or at least the gate of heaven, is Bethel. And then the, the, the place that God's going to place his name is, is in Jerusalem, just south of that. So it's right in that territory, but there's something about even the difference of Bethel and Jerusalem in, in the things that we're going to see, what, what transpired, what followed. Now, what I'm gonna, I told you before, First and Second Samuel matches First Chronicles. And first and second kings matches second chronicles. And, uh, but, but just for how they're laid out in the Bible, what I'm telling you is I want to look at the history uh, from the book of Kings. We could follow it from chronicles, but I want to follow it from Kings, so just to stay in, in one book. So go to first Kings chapter 8. The Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And just looking at these cities and the battles that go on, um, the kids sung about our battle, and certainly our battle is different than what we're seeing here between Jerusalem and, uh, and, and Babylon. That's for, all this is prophetic concerning God's purpose for the earth. 
in the age of grace, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not even battling for any place on the earth. Uh, we fight against principalities and powers in heavenly places because God's purpose for the body of Christ is the heavenly places. Uh, and and th so that's where God is going to use us. That's where our battles are. But as we look through here in, in, in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel, there's physical battles for a certain place on the earth because God has chose Jerusalem for His place. Uh, uh, Solomon builds the temple, and in 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, verse 1, it says, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the, the, the tribes of the chief of, of the fathers of, of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up, bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, uh, which is Zion. So they're going to put the, the Ark of the Covenant in, in the temple. He's going to dedicate the temple. Uh, he's going to actually reiterate the promises of God and, and, and then make a prayer before God in front of the people. Verse 12, it says, Then spake Solomon, The Lord said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. So Solomon actually builds a temple, which is going to be the house of God. And, and Solomon knows, and, and you know, a lot of times people you know, think about God being in a place. That One of the mistakes in the time we're living in is they mistake Israel and, and their, their worship of God in a temple as uh, relating to us gathering together in a church building. And, uh, and what we always have to clarify is this, this building is not the church. It belongs to the church. It's a church building. A church is the gathering of God's people, and we, God, God dwells in us today. Uh, and so it's a, it, it, it's a bad comparison to compare a church building to a temple, because God met with Israel in that temple. That's where His presence was. God's presence is not in this building. God's presence is in His people. And we gather together, so collectively God's presence is here. But when we all leave and we lock the doors, God's nowhere near in, in this building. He's not in the mice that might be running around. I don't think there are, but <laughs> He's not here. So it's a real mistake to, and people do that all the time. They call the church building the house of God. It's a big mistake to do that. Your body is the temple of, uh, of God, the, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. But when Solomon built the temple, he wasn't so naive to think, that now he built the house of God and God lives in a box. That he left heaven and somehow now dwells in this little box that he built. And, and Solomon built a, an extravagant temple. We talked about David buying the difference between the threshing floor and the whole site. Because the site is huge. Solomon built an extravagant temple here. And, but when he did, he, here's, here's a statement that he makes concerning the temple he built. Verse 26. It says, And now, O, Lord, o God of Israel... Let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant David, my father. But, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold the heaven, and heaven of heavens cannot contain him, cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. Yet have, uh, have, have uh, thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant, and to the supplication, uh, to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eye may be open toward this house uh, night and day, and toward the place which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant uh, maketh toward this place, and hearken thou unto the supplication of thy servant, that the people, that thy people Israel, uh, when they pray toward this place, and hear in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. So he knew that God wasn't confined to a box. That was the place where God's name was placed, where God's pl presence was manifested, and where Israel was to come and meet with God, where atonement was made to God, where prayers were made to God. And in Daniel, by the way, in the book of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar made a decree that no one could pray to their God, Daniel opened up the windows toward Jerusalem and prayed. And that's why he's doing that. Religions who all copy Christianity are 
Judaism in this case, uh, today, you know, they all have to pray a certain direction. And they, they get all that by copying the things that already were recorded in Scripture before their religion ever came around, before their God was even invented. So, but anyhow, that's how all that comes about. But Solomon realizes that's the place where God is going to meet with Israel, where his name is going to be known, where, he, where is going to be his dwelling. He's actually, when he asks that statement, I mean, I, I always wonder about how, what Solomon understood about uh, the person, the, the, uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Uh, they knew God was going to meet with them and come, uh, because of what the prophet said. But when he says in verse 27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Like his con ha the, the reason he's asking the question, he knows something about God. Behold the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. God's everywhere present. How could he just be, <laughs> how could he make, how could God as great and, and omnipresent as he is dwell on the earth? Well, he, he's just thinking about God's name and His presence made known in the, in, in the temple there. But just think, God's going to do it in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God is going to dwell on the earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God in human flesh dwelling in the earth. And people always, you know, they get into the Trinity. Oh, how can Jesus Christ, if He's God, pray on earth to Himself in heaven? Well, the Godhead is, is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God in His, in his ultimate form of God is everywhere present but he can take on that same time the form of a man and be here on earth in the person of Jesus Christ. So um, anyhow, Solomon, I, when I read that, I, I, I think of him thinking about the temple and the, the uniqueness uh, of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's Solomon, he's making that prayer. God answers him in chapter 9 uh, uh, concerning his prayer. Um, verse 1 it says, and it came to pass when Solomon uh, had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desires which he, which he was pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared unto him in, at Gibeon. So, you know, he, he made Solomon uh, the promise of his wisdom. Now he's, now he's responding to the prayer of Solomon and the dedication of the temple in chapter 8. And... Uh, uh, and when he dedicates that, I'll just keep reading. It says, The Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplications which thou made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. And thine eyes and, uh, and, thine eyes and, the, and my heart, mine eyes and my heart, uh, shall be there perpetually. And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in the integrity of his heart. Notice the if in that statement and in the uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then, verse 5, I, I will establish the, the throne of thy kingdom upon Jerusalem forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not uh, fail thee a man upon the throne, uh, a man upon the throne of, of Israel. But if ye, w if ye shall not... But if ye shall at all not turn from following me, nor uh, or ye nor your children, and will not keep my commandments. I don't think I read that right, did I? <laughs> That's the negative. <laughs> but they're not going to keep his commandments. If you don't keep my commandments and, and my uh, statutes, which I have set before you, uh, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. Now, you know, before he said the if and the then in verse 4, he already said, my eyes are on this place forever, that he's... That, God's picked that place forever as a, as, as a place that he is going to dwell in, where his presence is going to be made known. But then he gives that warning to Solomon about that if you don't keep, if you, you know, you follow what David did, then it's going to continue. If not, you or your children turn from me and follow other gods, then God's going to wipe Israel off the land. That's the warning. That is, by the way, what the, the, the covenant of law is is God said, I'll bless you if you keep my laws, I'll curse you if you break my laws. And certainly the first law has no other God before him. And when, when they have another God, then God's going to judge them. And that's going to be the means by which 
after Jerusalem becomes the main center of the earth, we're going to go from Jerusalem back to Babylon again. And that's an amazing thing. That's, uh, that's amazing that God would use that place <laughs> to judge Israel. Habakkuk couldn't get over that, but uh, that's for you to read the book of Habakkuk. Anyhow, come over to, uh, as well, while we're here, talking about the greatness of Solomon all. Go over to chapter 10, and just, just a, a verse of this. Chapter 10 is all about how great Solomon was and how great the nation of Israel had become and how great the city of Jerusalem had become. It's gone from being just a nation to a kingdom. And when I say that, verse 24 just stands out. It says, And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom which God hath put in his heart. Now that's ultimately God's purpose for Jerusalem is the son of David sitting on the throne in Jerusalem and all the world coming to hear his wisdom. His wisdom came from God. The ultimate son of David is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? Who's going to come back and restore Jerusalem, set his throne up there, and there's going to be ultimately, when you get to Genesis 22, a new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven and becomes the dwelling place of God on the earth and reaches into the heavens. But, but anyhow, it, it looks like you know, Solomon is like the Messiah in that sense. But Solomon is just a man. And there's another son of David that's going to fulfill that because after all that greatness, you come to chapter 11 of 1 Kings. You've already got the warning. And 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 1 says, well, the first word, but... <laughs> So you learned all about the greatness of Solomon and, and, the, and the place Jerusalem became in the earth. It says, but King Solomon loved many strange women. And uh, he's not talking about the character of the people. He, strange means Gentiles. <laughs> uh, uh, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, see, uh, 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 women of the Moabites, Ammonites, uh, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You should not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto, unto you. For surely they shall turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave to these in love. And, and, and he had set, and he, and he, and he had 700 wives, princesses. He wasn't even supposed to multiply wives, but he did. Princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart, and it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. And that begins the downfall of the, of the, the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem, in that Solomon, he himself maybe didn't worship those other gods, but when he brought these wives, married all these you know, probably princesses of all these other nations, brought them to Jerusalem. Well, you know, it's not long. Well, you got your temple and your God here. I, I, you took me away from my land. Where's my God? Where's my temple? So he eventually builds them a temple for their God in Jerusalem. And, he, and he's got all these gods of the Gentiles being represented there in Jerusalem. And his, the wives are turning his heart away from his God. He's not walking perfectly as David did. And, uh, and eventually there's an announcement that God, that, that, that because of this, his kingdom is going to be taken from him. Verse 11, it says, Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done, uh, that this, this is done of thee, uh, thou hast not kept my, co my covenant and my statutes which I commanded thee, I will surely rent the kingdom from thee and give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in the day that I, I will do it, I, I, I will in the in that in that day I will not do it for David thy bro, thy father's sake, but I will rent it out of the out of the hand of thy sons. Howbeit I will not rent away all the kingdom, but will give thee one tribe to the to the son of David my servant say, for my for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen. See. God, we can't get over the fact God has chosen Jerusalem, but because of Solomon's sin, he's going to rent the kingdom. The kingdom is going to be divided. You know from the New Testament, a kingdom divided against itself is going to fall. And, and what's going to happen through the rest of the kings, we're hardly going to get there, but is that, uh, the, that from Solomon the kingdom gets divided, and in, in the next uh, is it 400? No, 240 years, the kingdom is first going to get divided. There's going to be the ten northern tribes. They're going to become Israel, and, and Jeroboam's going to reign over them. They're going to pick a different king. 
Solomon is going to have, he's already king in Judah there, where Jerusalem's at, but Benj the tribe of Benjamin's going to stay with him, so Benjamin and Judah, the southern two tribes, are going to be the kingdom where the, the throne of David is established. The ten northern tribes are going to go into idolatry immediately because Jeroboam, see if I can pull this out, come over to chapter 12, in order to keep the ten northern tribes to, under his kingship, by the way, the southern two tribes are king after Dave, uh, Solomon is going to be his son Rehoboam. Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. But when Jeroboam in the north, he doesn't want people going down to Jerusalem, so he makes up an idolatrous re religious system. And that's what chapter 12 is all about. And uh, look at verse 28 before that bell rings. One of the things he did is he put an altar, well it says, whereupon, verse 28, he makes up a, a whole new worship system, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem, and even though it's south, it's up because it's altitude wise, behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Gods? And small g? You're talking about idols. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Ten miles north of Jerusalem, don't go, you go down, if you're going to up, you live up here in the north, and you live in the southern part of the north, stop at Bethel and worship there. If you live in the north part, just go up to Dan. That's the apostate tribe in the nation of Israel. They already inter were introduced to idolatry. And so he puts those two idols. We started out Bethel, the house of God, and Satan has now got an idol there. Satan's goal is to get that idol in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will fall to Babylon. We'll pick up there next week. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the class, and thank you how the different ways that we can study your Bible and, and see your plan and program worked out in Israel's case, and thank you for the uh, reminders that we have as we think about the Age of Grace and remind, are, are reminded of of your calling of us and your plan and purpose for us. Uh, so we thank you for the things we learned and, and even the spiritual lessons that are there for us to glean as we study these things and uh, pray as well for the service to follow and our look at back at, again at the book of Jonah. In Christ's name we pray, amen.